Hello, I'm Graham Steele, CEO and founder of CryptoSense, and welcome to session three of our crypto and crypto risk training. So if you were with us for sessions one and two, you'll have seen a overview of cryptography and in particular, some examples of how cryptography goes wrong in practice. And as I promised at the end of session two, we're now gonna go through in some more technical detail, a bunch of cryptographic operations, including encryption, signature, hashing, key derivation, password storage, and key management, and look a little bit more in detail about what this looks like in practice, look at some real lines of code to see how these functions are used, and look in detail at some of the hazards and some of the attacks and vulnerabilities that can arise from using these technologies. So let's get started right away then. Uh, with session three, we're gonna be looking today at encryption algorithms uh, and key lengths. So briefly, we're gonna look over what is a, a cipher, uh, give a bit of an overview of how ciphers are used in the Java cryptographic architecture. So we've just picked Java because it's a very widely used programming language and there's a lot of cryptography out there that uses the JCA. Uh, and so it gives a good understanding of how it looks in practice when real code calls cryptographic algorithms. But the things we're going to look at today apply pretty much to any widely used cryptographic API. And then to conclude the session, we're going to look at uh, some encryption algorithms and key links. Uh, and then in session four, we'll be going into more detail of how encryption in particular can go wrong in practice. So what exactly is a cipher? So we define a cipher through two functions. The first is the encryption function, which takes as an input a plain text. So that's just the message or the data that we want to encrypt. Uh, and it takes a key. We'll talk about where we get the keys from later. And it returns a cipher text. So a cipher text is the, the message in a way that is now unreadable uh, to an adversary, at least that's what we, what we hope. So if we encrypt uh, with key one, uh, some plain text X, then we get back some cipher text uh, Y. And then the cipher has a decryption function, which takes a cipher text and the key and returns the corresponding plain text. So we'll call that function D and it takes some key uh, K2, takes that Y, that uh, cipher text and gives us back uh, X. So you notice that we had key one and K2 there. That's because uh, we're going to talk about two kinds of ciphers, symmetric and asymmetric ciphers. So if we decrypt the encryption of X, so that was our Y, uh, we get back X again. If we do that in a case where key one and key two are identical, then this is called a symmetric key cipher. So the decryption key is identical to the encryption key. If key one is not the same as key two, then we have an asymmetric key cipher. Uh, and generally, as we see, uh, we will have to make it the case that uh, for this to be secure, not just that the decryption key is not the same as the encryption key, but the decryption key is impossible to derive from the encryption key. So there's no way that I can just figure out what the decryption key is once I've seen the encryption key in an asymmetric key system. So what does security mean? Well, these schemes are secure if it's not possible for an intruder to figure out the plain text X or uh, the decryption key indeed, uh, uh, the key K2 uh, from the cipher text Y, even if the adversary knows a whole bunch of corresponding pairs of plain text and cipher text, X1, Y1 to XN, YN, uh, and their corresponding key one, so their encryption key, uh, for if it's the case of an asymmetric key cipher. So what we're saying is it's not just that um, the intruder, we show them the cipher text and say, okay, go ahead, figure out what the plain text is in there. We also give the intruder a whole bunch of examples of, okay, this is the encryption of this message using that key. This is the encryption of message using that key. Uh, so the, the intruder has a lot of knowledge about how the system is working that might allow them to, to figure out uh, how to break it. And this is feasible in practice. Normally this is the sort of scenario we want to think about. But if we have security, then still given all this information, uh, the intruder is not going to be able to figure out our plain text text. So this is a somewhat informal definition of security. In the theoretical cryptography, we really go deep about what exactly it means for different kinds of scenarios to be able to break different sorts of ciphers to do with whether they're chosen plain text attacks or chosen ciphertext attacks or adaptive chosen ciphertext attacks and so on. But this gives a, a good intuition about what it's all about. So even if the uh, attacker can see some examples of the system uh, in use in the past, they still can't figure out the plain text for a particular ciphertext that they get given. 
So let's look at a concrete example of using cryptography in code. So we're going to look at the Java cryptographic architecture or JCA. So this is a very typical design of a cryptographic API in that it's trying to separate the idea of calling cryptographic services, so encryption functions or, or signatures or whatever it is, from their implementation. Uh, in particular, implementing cryptographic algorithms is a highly specialized task and extremely error prone uh, and something that you should try to avoid doing uh, under all circumstances, because no matter how expert you are, it's almost certain that your first implementation will contain security flaws. So generally, we want to use someone else's implementation that's been around for a long time, subject to a load of testing, preferably even open source, so other people have tested it as well, uh, and then we can have a bit more confidence. So the implementation of cryptographic algorithms comes from cryptographic service providers or CSPs. And then the programs just use the services that the CSPs uh, offer them. And a whole bunch of cryptographic APIs work in a similar way. So PKCS11 gives you an API which you can put different cryptographic tokens and hardware behind, uh, Windows CAPI, the old CAPI and, and CNG, the, the more recent API, uh, give you access to CSPs. In the same way, OpenSSL version 3 is also having an idea of independent implementations behind uh, the same API. So of course, uh, for this to be useful, the different implementations have to be able to work together. For example, if I generate a key, uh, key for the AES cipher with one implementation, then that same key has to work correctly when I use a different implementation to do the decryption, for example. Uh, and uh, more so if I make a signature with one implementation, with one CSP, then another CSP has to be able to verify that. So this requires standardization uh, in a lot more details than just the algorithm. And we're gonna be seeing a lot more of that standardization as we go through uh, these trainings, because uh, once this standardization happens, it tends to have a lot of inertia and we'll see a lot of outdated standards that are still around uh, as one of the ways that we can find ourselves confronted with a vulnerability in our cryptography. Then, of course, in JCA, we have algorithm independence. So this is a complementary idea, which is to say that, well, we might want to change the algorithm that we use for particular things. So it's something that we might sometimes call crypto agility, that the ability to change cryptographic algorithm for the same functions. So what we do with the API is that we provide a high level description of what the service is going to be rather than an algorithm. So instead of saying uh, encryption with AES, for example, we offer a, a cipher and then the cipher can be instantiated with different algorithms, uh, which are independent. Uh, so it makes it very easy for me to change the algorithm without having to change all uh, deep stuff in my code. So we can figure out what are the ciphers that are supported by a particular uh, provider. It's very easy. We can just write code to do that programmatically, uh, for example. So it's a little snippet of code here for Java, which just iterates through the providers that I've got and then looks uh, at their services to figure out which ones of those are ciphers. And then we just print out a, a string version of the, of the algorithm. So if I run that, for example, on, uh, on the old Java 8, this is the, the list of ciphers that I'm going to get. So we can see there's a whole bunch of interesting uh, and unusual stuff in there. Of course, there's AES. So you, you've probably heard of AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. This is the most widely used uh, symmetric block cipher. Um, but there's also a bunch of stuff you could say is historic in there. So there's the Blowfish uh, block cipher, which is a, a rather uh, old cipher now uh, with a short uh, block size. There's ARC4, which is uh, a stream cipher interoperable with the RC4 cipher because that was at the time um, under patent when the, this implementation was made. There's all sorts of varieties for wrapping. Uh, there's triple DES is in there. Uh, there's all sorts of strange stuff, including a whole bunch of uh, password-based encryption algorithms uh, standardized under PKCS5. So we're going to talk about these in a later training, but this is another great example of where uh, standardization um, was introduced to ensure interoperability. And as a result, we're, we're stuck with a whole bunch of uh, legacy constructions, for example, PBE with MD5, so that's an old and, and now outdated hash function, and single DES encryption, which is also uh, very outdated. So let's look at how we use a cipher. So a cipher in Java can be used in different ways by specifying a different uh, mode. And the different modes in Java are encrypt mode, decrypt mode, wrap mode, and unwrap mode. So encrypt and decrypt is pretty clear what they are. Wrap and unwrap correspond to encrypt and decrypt, but they're specifically used for encrypting other keys. Uh, and this is actually a very useful thing to be able to do. Uh, and we'll see more about that in our uh, little session on key management. Uh, it's a very important operation and one that can easily uh, go wrong and lead to issues. So we need a cryptographic key to be able to do our ciphering and, and decryption. And we can get hold of these keys in various different ways. Uh, for example, we can use a specialized uh, key generation algorithm that will 
generate for us a new fresh uh, key in a way that's completely uh, unpredictable. So cryptographically secure random number generators will be used. We can uh, do what's called key specification. So getting a key from somewhere else basically, and then um, telling Java how to use it. We can also fetch keys from uh, certificates. So a certificate is essentially a piece of information that tells you that a certain public key in an asymmetric key system belongs to a certain person. We're going to talk about those more also a little bit later. Uh, or we can get it out from a key store. So a key store is just a piece of uh, file, so a software file um, that we can load and grab keys out. And again, we'll talk about those a little bit more later as well. Uh, so let's look at the, the first example, so about generating keys. So uh, we have to generate a key that's specific to the algorithm that we're going to use it for. So as an example, in Java, we set up a key generator to say uh, we want to have a, a key generator for AES, and then we just uh, kick the, the method to, to generate a key, uh, and we get hold of our uh, new key. Uh, and so here, now we've got enough code to do, uh, for the first time, some real encryption using the AES algorithm. So we can ask for a cipher of uh, the type AES. We can generate ourselves a AES key. So that's using just the two lines of code from the previous slide. We can set the cipher, uh, initialize it to do uh, encrypt mode uh, with that particular key. So that key that we've uh, just generated. Uh, and then we can um, shove into a byte array, a cipher text, which is the result of uh, encrypting the string uh, test uh, converted into also into a byte array. So there we have it just in a few lines. I've actually done some real uh, AES encryption uh, in Java. And of course I can replace AES with any of the other ciphers that I've found is available in my uh, CSP. Um, and this is an example of a uh, crypto agility or algorithm independence. Uh, I can easily swap that over without having to change a whole bunch of things in, in my code. Uh, so generating asymmetric keys is pretty similar, except of course we need to generate uh, pairs of keys. So remember key one and key two are not the same in an asymmetric scheme. Uh, key one is a public key that I can give to anyone and key two is a private key I'll use for decryption that I have to keep secure for myself. So uh, I can just kick the key generator to do me uh, RSA, for example, so the most widely used uh, asymmetric uh, key system. Uh, and I generate a key pair. And this time I'll need to do uh, get private or get public to get the part of the key that I need. So for example, for RSA encryption, um, I get myself an RSA uh, cipher. Uh, I set up a key ge pair generator instead of a key generator. And instead of getting a key, I get a key pair. And then as you can see, when I do the encryption, I have to ask for the public part of the key. That's that bold get public there uh, to actually do that encryption with. Okay, so now we know what encryption and, the, uh, and, and code looks like for asymmetric and symmetric encryption. Uh, so let's look at a couple of things that can go wrong. So one thing that go wrong is instead of generating keys, um, specifying a key. So sometimes this can be the right thing to do because the key might be a secure, uh, well-generated key that we're picking up from somewhere else. But in practice, um, a very common mistake is to uh, hard code a key into the code for testing purposes. So I'm developing a new app. And I don't want to generate a new key each time. I want to use the same key every time so that I can keep working with the same test data. Uh, and I can do that like this. So here is a way to do that. I'm just setting up a uh, byte array that contains um, uh, the key that I'm going to use. This is eight bytes of keys, 64-bit key to use with single des. And then I'm just saying, okay, create a secret key uh, using that key data uh, for using for single des. Uh, and so this is obviously a big problem because generally speaking, it's much easier for an in intruder to get hold of the code for uh, an application than to get hold of, say, the sensitive keys which are stored in some secure hardware. And if they can read the uh, encryption key from the code, then they can do all sorts of nasty things like decrypt our data. And this really does go wrong in practice a lot, in fact, that these test keys sneak from uh, test into production. Uh, so it's a good thing to, to look for uh, reviewing this kind of code. Just to uh, round out, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, key lengths. So some algorithms uh, are defined for different key lengths. So I can say I want to use AES, for example, and uh, as you have seen, the key table that we had a few slides ago, I can use 128, 192, or 256-bit keys. And I might have a policy that says I want to use uh, longer keys for long-term sensitive data that might need to be secure long into the future when perhaps there will be uh, quantum computers around which can uh, be used to break smaller size keys for, for AES. So here's a bit of code to generate me a 256-bit key. So I'm saying, okay, go ahead and give me a key generator for AES, uh, init it, uh, use that constructor with 256, and then generate the, the key. Um, but if I run that program, um, generally speaking, I will get an exception saying that this key size uh, is illegal. And that's because of a little quirk around export regulations. 
so I have to replace uh, certain files in uh, my Java config uh, with some unlimited ones in order to be able to generate those kind of uh, long keys. Well, this is all for uh, more kind of historical political reasons, we can say than for technical reasons, but it is an error that people often uh, fall over. Um, if you look on Stack Overflow, you can see a ton of people falling over this issue. So what key size should I be using? So in the most uh, recent eCrypt report, so eCrypt was a long running European collaborative project between top academic institutions around cryptography. The report from 2018, we find the following recommendations. So for symmetric key uh, ciphers, uh, they say that uh, 80 bits uh, is okay uh, for legacy, but if I'm making a new system, I should be using 128 bits for the near term and 256 bits for the long term. And similarly for RSA, uh, 1024 is considered a legacy key length. Near term, they suggest 3072 bits and long term, 15,360 bits. So this is interesting already because um, near term 3072, well, most of the certificates that you'll find being used, for example, in TLS exchanges uh, on the internet when you're just browsing the web are not 3072 bits. They'll be, uh, if they're using RSA, it'll be 2048 bits uh, already. So all of these things fail the, the ECRIT report. Um, and you won't find many 15,360 bit uh, RSA keys out there in use, mostly because the operations using them would be uh, extremely slow. Um, but we can see that there's the an interesting thing already about cryptography here, which is that the opinions about what are the correct uh, values to be using uh, vary. There, there's not a hard and fast rule about what's the correct rules to use. And you can look online and find other recommendations about key lengths from NIST, for example, from the BSI, uh, the German um, security agency. Uh, and in the end, your choice will probably come down to the regime, uh, the regulatory regime that you're operating under. Uh, that you have to comply with, whether it's NIST for, for FIPS or, or whatever it is. Okay, so just to finish a few references there, you can follow up. So you can grab the slides uh, from underneath the, uh, the YouTube video uh, and you can follow and track some of these things down. So thanks for uh, being with us today for this session on an uh, introduction to encryption. So in the next session, what we're going to look at is the way that encryption gets applied in practice, uh, particularly to the large scale data and how doing that can lead to a whole uh, set of different vulnerabilities if we're not careful. So do stay with us and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future updates and I'll see you again here soon. Mm -hmm.